Hello, Hal and Michael. How are you? Thanks for having us. Uh, thanks for showing up. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright, uh, publisher of the Non-Zero Newsletter. This is a Non-Zero podcast. And I normally introduce my guests, but since there are two of you, uh, I'd like you to introduce yourself so that people who are just listening on audio and not watching this will, uh, will start to associate your, your voices with your names. I will say beforehand that what we're going to discuss is your new book, Danger Zone, The Coming Conflict with China, which you've co-authored. So, uh, Michael, you want to just say a couple words about yourself? Sure. Yeah, I'm a professor at Tufts in the political science department and a non-resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute down in D.C. And most of my research looks at uh, shifts in the balance of power with a special focus on the U.S. and, and Chinese power balance. And your last name is Beckley, correct? Yes. OK. Hal? Hi, I'm Hal Brands. I uh, am a professor at Johns Hopkins SICE. I'm a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and I write a weekly column on national security for Bloomberg Opinion. All right, thank you. So uh, why don't we talk about the book? It's a very interesting book, uh, because in part, um, it is, unless you object to this label, it's, it's, a, it's a China Hawk book, right? You would call yourselves China Hawks? That's yeah. probably fair. Yeah, re reluctant hawks, but yeah, hawks. Oh well, aren't they all? Uh, the um, but it's different. It's different from uh, a lot of China hawk arguments. And let me uh, give you my understanding of how it differs. And in the course of that, characterize your argument, and maybe get things wrong, and then I'll give you a chance to correct me and respond. But uh, it seems to me that, that kind of the traditional China hawk argument has been, you know, kind of. China's on the march, more and more powerful economically, militarily, encircling the world with this Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and it has malicious intent and is a threat to our way of life and so must be stopped. You two, I think, kind of hang on to the part about malicious intent and threat to our way of life. Correct me if I'm wrong about that. But, but the other part of your argument is almost the opposite. It's like, uh, China actually has kind of passed its peak. It faces demographic problems. It faces economic problems. This Belt and Road thing's not working out so well. Uh, it, it, it's, its regional assertiveness is getting put more and more pushback. So it's more and more strategically encircled. And so whereas the traditional argument is we must do something to contain China because it's on the march, you say we must do something to contain China because it's not because you say it's exactly powers like this that are kind of declining, getting insecure about it, about their status, feeling threatened, that are most likely to lash out dangerously. And so and we we have to stop that. And you have a pretty assertive approach to stopping it, I would say. Is that all more or less fair? I, I think that's fair. I mean, I think the kind of the conventional wisdom is that China is 10 feet tall and you should be terrified. And our argument is that China is not 10 feet tall and you should be terrified uh, because it is uh, a country that increase, it faces more and more problems, strategic, economic, political, uh, which are going to make it hard for Xi Jinping's government to achieve the very lofty ambitions it has set out over the long term. But in the near term, China actually has a pretty attractive window of opportunity, not least militarily in the Western Pacific. And it will be more tempted to use that window of opportunity to jump through it precisely because uh, its leaders are going to recognize that it faces strong headwinds over the long term. Okay. Michael, anything you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I mean, we, we just think China's become the most dangerous kind of country because it's strong and ambitious enough to upend the international order, but for various reasons, a slowing economy, uh, a population that's about to age and die off in unprecedented numbers, uh, encirclement by a pack of powerful democracies. We just think that we worry that China's leaders are feeling like their time is, is running out to remake the world. And that's just very scary because it was the peaking powers in history that really caused most of the trouble, whether it's Germany in 1914, Japan in 1941. I would even, we even argue that Russia today, uh, you know, bears some of this pattern out. And so when you match that with where China seems to have been headed over the last decade, it already seems to be inching its way down this nasty historical 
path just becoming exponentially more repressive at home and aggressive abroad. And we just worry it's going to it's going to be poised to do what past peaking powers did, which is rush through these near term windows of opportunity before this longer term window of vulnerability opens wide. And we think this could play out in a few ways. It could obviously be an assault on Taiwan. Um, it could also be this push to basically create an economic empire across the global south or to engage in political warfare, this sort of concerted effort to destabilize democracies and prop up autocrats around the world. And so we then come up with a strategy that tries to blunt uh, this potential surge of, of Chinese aggression. Okay, what was the second of those three again? Can you spell that out a little uh, carving bit? Carving out an economic empire across the global south, basically using ch big Chinese loans to get countries hooked on Chinese finance, where they are then compelled to buy Chinese products and services, employ Chinese workers to build Chinese smart city systems, and then send all the data back to Beijing. And basically, countries become economically beholden to China, and that allows China to manipulate their both domestic and foreign policies so that they tow the CCP line. Okay. So there's a lot there. I think I'd like to, for the time being, put uh, put Taiwan off in a kind of a corner to visit later, because it does seem to me distinctive. You know, it, it it's, uh, there clearly is, is a threat that China could, could invade Taiwan, but the, the motivation would have to do with this kind of particular historical connection to Taiwan. It considers Taiwan part of China. And in fact, we don't even recognize Taiwan as a, a sovereign country. Most of the world doesn't. So, so in other words, I, I, I doubt you would you would see an invasion of Taiwan as a as a harbinger of larger territorial aspirations. In other words, you're not thinking like, oh, then South Korea, then Japan. They're, it's not the kind of argument people were making about Putin and Ukraine, right? Am I right about that? Um, to, to some extent, although I would note that China has been pretty clear about what its territorial aims are, what it feels are lost Chinese territories that have to be taken back. And while they 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 don't include necessarily the Japanese mainland, they do include about 80 percent of the East and South China seas. And those seas are the vital arteries for the economic lifelines for most of China's uh, coastal neighbors. and so. We just worry that if China were to somehow consolidate control over Taiwan, it's not that they're going to go on a Hitler style rampage across the rest of East Asia, but they could start flexing their muscle and really trying to turn those uh, international waterways and to make them look more like a Chinese lake where they decide who gets in, who gets out. And if you want easy access to it, you have to grant China certain concessions. I mean, that's a fundamentally different uh, maritime environment than the one that currently prevails. Yeah, and I, I would add to that that control of Taiwan makes Chinese coercion easier up and down the Western Pacific, whether that's with respect to Japan or the, the Philippines or any other country in the region. And it makes Chinese power projection even beyond what we often call the, the first island chain far easier because you've essentially blown a hole in the line of islands and features that obstruct China's access to the open Pacific. And, and so it is not guaranteed that if China were to take Taiwan, it would subsequently apply coercion or aggression against other countries in the region. But if it decided to do so, its prospects for success would be much, much greater with Taiwan part of the Chinese defense perimeter than they are today. And in your view, that's why the U.S. should intervene militarily to keep them from taking Taiwan? I, I think our, our view is that a U.S.-China war over Taiwan would be catastrophic, probably for pretty much everybody involved. We, we certainly, we the United States, would not want to see that succeed. But I think our policy recommendations are more in the vein of what can we do to try to deter China from uh, using force against Taiwan in the first place, recognizing that once they have done so, there are few good options left. Now, the options, the things that we say the United States should do to help deter Chinese aggression against Taiwan would also be very useful if the United States did make a decision to defend Taiwan in the event of Chinese aggression. But but I think this this point that what we're interested in really is deterrence is, is worth making because we're not arguing that conflict with China is inevitable. What we're arguing is that it's becoming more likely, particularly if the United States does not act quickly 
to make conflict look unappetizing, even from the perspective of a more risk acceptant Chinese Communist Party. OK, and are you um, so you favor uh, accelerating the arming of Taiwan, I think you mentioned the general problem of countries seeing a closing window of opportunity to be assertive. Uh, it seems to me, in principle, uh, accelerating the arming can uh, make them a little uh, more inclined to exploit the current window. I mean, I think Ukraine is a good example. You know, uh, halfway through the Trump administration, uh, we started arming Ukraine. Uh, advocates of that said this will deter Putin from invading. They were wrong. And you can imagine uh, the arming having had the opposite effect. In fact, Putin pretty much said as much in one of his pre-invasion speeches when he said, you know, they're just turning, they're flooding uh, more and more. This is a de facto NATO outpost, more and more weapons. And uh, obviously, if you think, certainly if you plan to invade eventually, this incentivizes you to do it now. But also if you think, well, maybe we're going to have to uh, take it uh, forcefully. And the more uh, kind of proprietary America seems about Taiwan, the more likely that is. And so if there's just going to be more and more arms coming in, we better strike now. In principle, at least in, in theory, that could be the way this affects China's incentive structure, right? That, that is absolutely a risk that we have to be cognizant of. I mean, that, I think that's why in our, our policy recommendations, we are against uh, things where you're you're actively provoking China by, uh, you know, changing Taiwan policy, changing America's relationship with Taiwan or Taiwan's international status um, and, and more in favor. You know, a lot of our recommendations aren't necessarily flooding the area with every single arm under the sun, but it's a lot of it's spreading out um, America's bases, just trying to make them more resilient. Same thing on Taiwan and then increasing existing defensive munitions that would allow, that wouldn't allow Taiwan to do offensive operations against Taiwan, against uh, the mainland, but would allow Taiwan to defend itself. Now there's no getting around the fact that if China sees, you know, something even like mines, which are traditionally viewed as defensive weapons, China would view those as an offensive weapon in the hands of Taiwan, just because it could mean the permanent separation of Taiwan from the mainland. And I think at the end of the day, there is no getting around the fact that this will be uh, uh, certainly provocative to Beijing. But our, our feeling is just that we've reached a stage now where there's not a lot of convincing or persuading Xi Jinping to leave Taiwan alone. China's already carrying out the most provocative show of force there in the strait, and they've built up this huge military and are doing practice bombing raids on mock full scale mock ups of Taiwanese ports and American aircraft carriers. So we don't think that there's a lot of there's there's not much space for persuading China to somehow back off of Taiwan. And so we're sort of left with the remaining options, which is to shore up deterrence and also to to basically prepare for damage limitations so that hopefully you can deter China from moving in the first place. But in a worst case scenario where they do, at least you've built up some of the big stick you need. Uh, to try to make this uh, invasion or blockade fail. Okay, so so you started by saying you 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 don't you want to try to avoid being uh, provocative if possible. I want to I want to read you a little uh, passage from your book. Uh, it, it uses the term danger zone. Title of your book. I I, I want to be explicit if we haven't been that that you see the danger zone as this kind of like next ten years or so when China still has the power to do damage is feeling insecure. That's the most difficult part of the relationship to navigate. So you write, playing defense requires a good offense. The U.S. cannot get through the danger zone without calculated risk taking. It must be willing to anger China, bait it into strategic blunders, and selectively roll back its power. Um, I, I thought of this this morning. I'm not sure when this is going to air exactly, but this is the morning that uh, I woke up to find that uh, Putin has ordered a partial mobilization and has made his least veiled reference ever to using nuclear weapons, I think, in this context. And I just kind of thought, you know, China, one thing that has in common with Russia is nuclear weapons. But you're this is your you say we should be willing to anger China, bait into strategic blunders. That that's that's part of the idea. Yeah. So there's maybe it's useful to distinguish between kind of good provocation and and bad provocation here. And and so there if you are um, unwilling to do anything that angers or provokes China or hurts the feelings of 1.4 billion Chinese people, as the CCP likes to say, then you have just taken off the table 
anything the United States can do to strengthen its position vis-a-vis -vis China. Every time the United States uh, approves the sale of arms to Taiwan, every time the United States deploys additional military assets in the Western Pacific, every time the United States takes steps to try to prevent Huawei from becoming uh, the leading uh, provider of 5G telecommunications uh, hardware and software, that is offensive, that is provocative to, to China. But you simply cannot accomplish your aims if you're the United States without being willing to do things that strengthen the American position vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, this is most clear, I think, when it comes to the military balance of the Western Pacific, but you could make the point across an array of other issues as well. And it's very difficult, moreover, for the United States to uh, achieve its aims, let's say, in the technological competition without doing things that actively injure uh, pillars of the CCP system. And so what the United States has done fairly effectively over the past two or three years is basically tried to kneecap Huawei by denying it access to the high-end high semiconductor uh, global rollout. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about selectively rolling back Chinese power, being willing to provoke uh, China, and so on and so forth. What we should not do is do things that sort of gratuitously or symbolically uh, anger and offend China, but don't increase our ability to compete effectively. And, and so this uh, has come up recently in some of the discussions of uh, a piece of legislation that's called the Taiwan Policy Act. Uh, this was like a recording on September 21st. It was marked up uh, in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee last week. And some of the stuff that was in the initial text of, of that bill would essentially have destroyed America's one China policy, basically would have fundamentally changed the framework of U.S. Uh, governmental relations with Taiwan in, in mostly symbolic ways, uh, renaming the basically the Taiwanese governmental representative's office in the United States, making the head of uh, AIT, the American Institute in Taiwan, which is kind of the de facto embassy, a Senate confirmed official, so, so, so on and so forth. None of that stuff would have meaningfully strengthened Taiwan's ability to preserve its freedom or strengthened America's ability to defend Taiwan, but it would cause major disruption in the relationship. That's provocation without a purpose. And that's the sort of thing we should avoid. And, and just quickly, do you uh, think Biden should, he seems to have just changed our stated policy. I mean, I think uh, the, uh, he's now saying we will defend Taiwan and, and most recently saying we will send American soldiers to die. Uh, th that seems to be now the policy. I mean, they can do these pro forma rollback, uh, you know, walkbacks every time he says it, but I think nobody's taking those seriously. Do you think that's a good idea? I so maybe Hal and I this may be an area where we differ, but I I don't think it's it's a great idea to be making these statements prior before it's a sequencing issue. I mean, if you want to change the policy somewhere down the line, maybe you can do it, but you have to first build up the capabilities to be able to enforce your end of the bargain. And a key point we try to make in the book is that the United States has has lagged behind in terms of reacting to China's military strategy and really putting in place the kind of resilient force it would need to confidently say that it could come to Taiwan's um, aid. And I, I also just worry that, you know, traditionally U.S. policy has been about dual deterrence. You didn't have to just deter Beijing from conducting an invasion. You also had to deter the Taiwanese from making rash moves towards independence. There's obviously an election coming up in, in Taiwan in 2024. I think we've sort of taken for granted that the current president of Taiwan, Tsai Ing-wen, is, is, is a pragmatist and has gone out of her way to try to not rock the boat with China, even as she tries to strengthen her nation. But there's no guarantee that in this next election, which she can't run in, that um, a candidate from, from her party uh, may take a much more aggressive approach to moving Taiwan uh, further along down the path towards some sort of independence. So the United States needs to have some kind of leverage, and traditionally it's used that ambiguous commitment to do that, I just worry that the U.S. is shifting away from that without building up the capability to back up those commitments. Okay. So I said we'd put Taiwan off in a corner for later discussion. Apparently, I failed in that endeavor. Uh, so m maybe we should uh, turn to something else. Uh, uh, first, let me let me get clear on a related issue. You know, the, China has been regionally assertive, as you said, 
There are it's in disputes with various countries over kind of maritime territory, islands, uh, things that weren't islands but are now islands. A lot, a lot of things, um, and I think most. Uh, for me, most uh, kind of troublingly, it is uh, it is it first asserted this thing called, I think, what is it, the nine dash line or something, some some relatively expansive claim of, of general uh, ocean territory. And then when it when the relevant international tri tribunal ruled against it, it said it wasn't going to abide by the ruling. I, I would, uh, uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd rather we 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 try to build a world in which these rulings are respected. I personally think the, the U.S. has been very guilty in, in failing itself to abide by the norm of compliance with international law and bear some of the blame. But anyway, all this is troubling. My question for you is, what do you think China's main motivation is in this expansiveness? And you said you worry that down the road, if it controls as much of the ocean as it would like to, it could use that as leverage but I, I, I believe I recall from your book, you, you don't necessarily see that as its main motivation, right? I mean, uh, is, it, it, is its primary concern making sure that nobody can do that to it? I, I think there's certainly, a, a, from a Chinese perspective, a strong defensive motive um, in the sense that, you know, China is critically and chronically dependent on foreign economies for its own livelihood. It imports 80% of its oil um, and high-end computer chips and manufacturing equipment and medical devices. It's the number one food importer of the world. And something like 90% of Chinese trade passes through the South China Sea on its way to the Chinese mainland. And so China is doing what great powers tend to do, which is secure their vital economic lifelines. Now, the problem is that, you know, this, what looks like a defensive effort from China's perspective, looks to other countries like China's attempt to essentially annex these vital international waterways, which are also vital for all the other states in um, the region. And so that, of course, sets up a severe conflict of interest between China and its neighbors, as well as the United States, which maybe is not nearly as economically dependent on these waterways as those countries is trying to uphold this principle of the freedom of navigation. You mentioned the 2016 uh, case that where the Philippines took China to the, the, the world court, the permanent court of arbitration in The Hague and won its case, you know, the court ruled that China's claims were null and void, and China just dismissed it as what they called a kangaroo court, and then proceeded to send even more of its armed Coast Guard cutters, fishing fleet, and to continue to militarize these islands. So it just shows you that China will take whatever steps it, it, it needs to secure these waterways, and that is a severe threat for the states in the region. Just, just to add one point to this, I mean, I think it's sometimes easy to forget just how radically expansive some of China's territorial claims are. And, and so the, you know, the area that is disputed between China and India is the size of like a small European country. Uh, you know, China claims about 90% of the South China Sea, not as an informal zone of influence, but as its territorial waters, right? So it's basically like if the United States said, uh, you know, our territorial waters extend to the coast of Venezuela, right? That that would be the relevant uh, comparison here. And so even when we're talking about, you know, kind of what we often think of as like narrow territorial claims or territorial disputes with neighbors, we're actually talking about things that would represent a marked departure from the status quo if they were to be accepted. And just on, on the point of international law, um, you know, without relitigating longer disputes about where the United States has strengthened it and where the United States has, has weakened it, the irony of the current situation is that, you know, China is a party to the Law of the Sea Treaty and doesn't observe it. The United States has never ratified the Law of the Sea Treaty, but does observe its provisions. And, and so it's sort of an odd situation that we find ourselves in. Yeah, I was thinking more about the the uh, international law against transborder aggression and our repeated uh, invasion of countries without uh, the authority of the Security Council. But uh, but uh, you know, I mean, I'd also like to see us uh, sign on to the Law of Sea Treaty. And you may be right that we've never never violated anyway, which would be commendable. The um, uh, so uh, now now Michael, you you mentioned that from China's point of view. The main motivation may be defense if it feels threatened. This is a theme in your book that it, that that it feels threatened. That's one of the reasons we should worry. Uh, 
about a lashing out. The um, you also alluded to the fact that perspective is different. Of course, you're both very well of what's called the security dilemma, where behavior that is considered defensive by the side doing it, you know, putting military installations in, claiming territories, even I guess, uh, is taken as either either read as offensive in intent by the other side, or is just thought of as a potential future offensive threat, leaving aside the actual motivation behind it. Um, it seems to me this is a a recurring problem in, in international affairs, as you know. Uh, it, it does seem to me it's important to try to figure out, like, if, if their feeling threatened is actually the main motivation for doing something that we fear they could later use offensively, it does seem to me it would be nice to work hard to actually figure out a way to ease their concerns, right? To make them feel less threatened about, you know, guaranteed international access to these, these ver whatever it is you want to do, right? Now, now I don't, I don't think you talk about that in the, in the book, but doesn't it seem to me, doesn't seem to you in principle, a, a worthy avenue to pursue? Well, in, in the book, we talk about the the long era of U.S. engagement of China, you know, starting from the 1970s going all the way until, I mean, you, one could argue maybe the latter half of the Obama administration, certainly the Trump administration. But, you know, the, the United States, you could argue, you know, maybe didn't do an effective job in every area, but certainly tried to reach out to China and say, look, we're, we're the, the offer is essentially you can become a, a a stakeholder in this existing order that doesn't require countries to go out and be able to protect all of their supply lines because we have an open global economy with secure sea lanes around the world and you can sell into whatever market you want to and what we're asking is you're going to join the world trade organization that's great china to its credit did revamp big parts of its regulatory apparatus to abide by that but clearly china didn't fulfill many obligations that it had under the world trade organization massive subsidies to Lots of its companies that act as an informal trade barrier that allows China to basically monopolize various industries or the Amazon effect, um, as well as I, uh, intellectual property theft of a whole range of, of violations of what China originally agreed to sign on to. And so it just seems like, you know, the Chinese said, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Um, we're actually at the end of the day, we don't trust you. Um, I think that trust is going to be extremely hard to build back up. And we actually want to carve out our own system we didn't have uh, we weren't around to write this existing liberal order we want to carve out our own empire which includes taiwan and 80 to 90 percent of the east and south china seas just as straight up chinese territory and we also want to have this economic empire where countries are more beholden to us um, because we are their main um, bilateral lender and trader um, and we don't want to have to necessarily work through these international organizations and through um, uh, an open global economy um, and so, it, you know, I, I, I think that from at least an economic perspective, the United States, you know, the, the big criticism is that the United States took this too far and didn't abandon it when China clearly wasn't willing to abide by its end of the bargain. Um, and so it's just, you know, yes, there are security dilemma, but at a certain stage, you have to recognize that a country just views its interest, that it's a revisionist power and wants to fundamentally change this system and no amount of um, you know, falling over yourself and granting it concessions is going to change those fundamental interests. Yeah, I, I mean, of course, we and I'm not an expert on who has done more of what. And certainly on the intellectual property theft front, I'm sure China's well in the lead. I, I, but I know as, as far as illegal subsidies, we get accused of that kind of thing. Right. I mean, I assume that this uh, the EV subsidies in the in the latest bill is going to get taken to the WTO by somebody. Maybe I'm wrong, but. We get we get accused of doing these things, I, and I'm not sure our, our record of abiding uh, by the rulings of the WTO tribunal is as great as it once was. Now, maybe, maybe uh, the Trump administration is part of the issue. I, I know Trump actually tried to more or less destroy the functioning of the WTO by not by by precluding the reappointing of judges and just basically paralyzing the whole tribunal. So, so I would say the U.S.'s recent past is is not. Uh, exactly a history of working to bolster the authority of the WTO, right? Uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm not an expert. I, I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I'm not going to argue with you over uh, over who's doing uh, more on the uh, kind of illegal subsidy front. I do have a question. Like, wh do 
it seems to me this was not always the case. N not all that long ago, China had uh, a reputation for kind of uh, trying to abide with uh, with with the rules of the road in uh, as as well as many countries. It, it's it seems to have gotten worse uh, under the Xi in the Xi Jinping era. Is your view that this is something that can be clearly linked to Xi Jinping, the, the worsening of China, China's compliance with rules of the road, or it was happening all along, was part of the plan, or what? Well, I think it's it's complicated, and and sort of there's there's two ways of looking at this. Uh, one is that I think it's it's fair to say that the United States has a China problem rather than a Xi Jinping problem, and the clearest way of understanding this is to just look at the fact that the major change in China's behavior vis-a-vis -vis the United States and vis-a-vis -vis the rules of the road or the international system, whatever you want to call it, predates Xi Jinping. And, and so the major turn in Chinese behavior came under Hu Jintao. It, it came during and after the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009. That was when China asserted the nine dash line. That was when China started claiming the South China Sea as, as a core interest. That was when the tone of U.S.-China relations began to change in a significant way. And Xi Jinping didn't come along for another two or three years. Uh, and so this is clearly part of a deeper set of ambitions in Chinese foreign policy. And you can even, if you want to take this argument to its extreme, I'm not sure I would go this far, but you could make the argument that Xi Jinping is, he's not the independent variable, he's the dependent variable. That as you got... Uh, a China that was more ambitious, that's power had been growing, you would have gotten somebody like Xi Jinping, more internationally assertive, even if he himself didn't exist. The reason I might not go that far is because it's clear that Xi Jinping personally has a major influence on Chinese foreign policy. And the trends that I just described have gone into overdrive under uh, under Xi Jinping. And so there, there was a step change in Chinese assertiveness, say, between 2011 and, and where we are now or where we were during COVID, you've seen the political system become more and more personalized under Xi Jinping as he's stripped away uh, the protections that were put in place after Mao Zedong died to basically prevent China from veering off the road as it had during his era uh, once again. And Xi Jinping has increasingly uh, linked China's global ambitions to his own ambitions. Uh, and so you can see this when you think about the case of Taiwan. I guess, you know, we try to get away from it, but all roads lead back to Taiwan in, in a sense. Uh, it used to be under uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping, for instance, that Chinese leaders would say that they could wait, you know, 100 years for the Taiwan issue to be resolved. Under Xi Jinping, he says the issue cannot be passed down from generation to generation. The way that statement is sometimes interpreted by China watchers, although there's a debate over this, to, to be fair, is that he's saying it shouldn't be passed down to the next generation of Chinese leaders. In other words, I'd like to have this issue resolved on my watch as part of my political legacy. And, and so the, the personality clearly does matter. She's background clearly does matter. The changes that he's made to the political system clearly do matter, even though there is a longer story here. OK, the uh, we, we were talking about the WTO. Let me use that as a way to transition to the the question of the role of China's uh, authoritarian, autocratic mode of government in in its approach to international relations. So um, you write uh, the United States. We're here. You're getting into what you recommend. The United States may need to temporarily downgrade institutions such as the WTO that govern the liberal international order because those institutions were not designed to deal with an authoritarian predator inside the gates. Now, I, it doesn't seem to me that an authoritarian country has inherently a problem with the WTO, right? Because the WTO doesn't pass judgment. It doesn't penalize countries for uh, their style of government or lecture them about human rights or anything else. I mean, it may be that China has come to be less and less compliant with WTO rules, but I, I'm curious as to why you you depict this as a kind of inherent problem with I, I'm sure I can find authoritarian countries that comply with the WTO rule, rules, right? So why why did you uh, choose to put it that way? I think there's you know people often call it state capitalism. One problem for the WTO is that if you have a very powerful state that can just shovel money into strategic 
industries, they can manipulate markets. They can use the iron fist of state power to counteract the, the invisible hand of the market. And you're right, certain autocracies can exercise restraint and, and not do that. But China, especially after the 2008 financial crisis, started rolling out these incredibly ambitious industrial policies where they've actually been quantified by a recent study, which shows that this, it's greater than any country in history, both in absolute size you know, I'm and not as denying, a share of its I'm not, I'm not denying anything you say about what China has done. I'm just curious as to whether you really think, because you know, the US has thrown its weight around in international institutions. We decided that the, uh, the head of the uh, Organization for the Prevention of Chemical Weapons should be fired. John Bolton decided, I guess, and, and they fired him. They got rid of him, you know, um, and, and that's just not the way things should run. But we have thrown our weight around in international institutions, and yet we're a liberal democracy. And I, I, I'm just I'm wondering why you think authoritarianism per se uh, leads to this. Well, I mean, in the case of the WTO, it's just made it a completely ineffective organization because the, w, the litigation takes a long time. And it's actually very hard to things like non-tariff barriers like subsidies are hard to trace to explicit WTO rules that outlaw them as opposed to just blatant tariffs. And so this litigation would take years and years. And like there's many cases, for example, in the solar industry where China ramped up its subsidies there and basically took over the market and is now the dominant. Yeah, I'm not denying producer. any. I'm no, not, but just let me just, but just, just let me just yeah. finish this. So the problem is it made the, the organization fundamentally ineffective. And then the United States reacted by saying, well, then we're not going to abide by those rules and to start upholding the judges. And so you can point the blame at a number of actors. But th I think this illustrates at how um, a state dominated economy can can if it if it uses those tools can be functionally incompatible with the letter and the law of this existing international institution. So a statist economy, you think, is OK. Anyway, I, I, I'm not. Uh, I, I guess so this is a larger issue um, about the role of, you know, the, the, the authority does does China um, how big a problem for us, not the Chinese people? And it's anything that's a problem for any people anywhere is regrettable in my view. But how much of a problem for us and uh, the rest of the world and other liberal democracies is is China's authoritarian autocracy um, kind of inherently? And uh, I want to read a sentence from the book. A deeply authoritarian state can never feel safe in a world dominated by democracies because liberal international norms challenge illiberal domestic practices. And I think here it kind of depends on what you mean by liberal international norms. It's funny. I had uh, uh, John Eikenberry on who, who actually coined the term or at least made it famous liberal internationalism. I asked him what it means. He said, well, there's actually two interpretations. One is it's the rules of the road that states uh, obey in dealing with one another. In other words, it's not about their domestic policies. It's not about their human rights record. It's not liberal in that sense. It's about a liberal, a globally liberal economic order uh, and, and you know, a, a, an attendant political order. There are, there are rules of the road about aggression and so on. But um, that's one interpretation. The other interpretation is that also part of liberal international norms are these norms about your, you know, your how you govern your country, human rights policy? Are you democratic and and so on? Now it seems to me a deeply authoritarian state only has trouble with liberal international norms if you're defining them to include that second set of 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 norms. That's what I would have thought. On the other hand, you're saying that no authoritarians are inherently problematic at the in the WTO. And I still don't understand what your argument is there, but but that's your claim. You seem to think that even if uh, we just kind of quit preaching about human rights and sanctioning countries for uh, based on their form of government and human rights and so on, um, there would that there would still be a problem with China obeying by the the what would remain of liberal international norms, I guess, by virtue of its authoritarianism. Is that right? I think China doesn't have a whole lot of interest in either piece of the liberal international order. And so, so China, the Chinese Communist Party certainly doesn't have much interest in living in a world where human rights are widely respected and there is a norm that human rights should be respected by government. Doesn't have right. any interest in, in living agree. in a world where 
democratic forms of government are, are dominant, and there is an expectation that democracy is the best form of government. And right. frankly, it doesn't have much interest in living in a world where you pursue what the Chinese would call win-win cooperation in the economic sphere. I mean, this is this is Mike's point, right? Which when we were talking about the WT, you know, the Chinese government talks a great game when it comes to uh, free trade and an open international economy. The policies it has pursued are frankly mercantilist and, and predatory. They are designed to allow China to dominate key industries, to hollow out those industries in other countries, to make other countries economically dependent on China. That, that's not the liberal internationalist vision of how the international economy is supposed to work. So you can take either definition of liberal internationalism that you like, and the CCP is going to have trouble actually living in either world. That To judge by its recent behavior, um, you know, that's the argument you're making. And I, I honestly haven't studied all of this enough to to agree or disagree with that. But 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 my question is, you think th it, it's failure to what you see is it's it's uh, really unusual by global standards, failure to comply with the rules of the road, just in terms of relations with other nations, trade rules and so on. That flows, you think, from its authoritarianism, even though it used to do a much better job of complying and was authoritarian then. I, I think there's been major changes in, in China's governance structure. I mean, there, there was this perception for a while in the 90s and 2000s that China was evolving towards um, a, a, a smarter form of autocracy where you actually rule more by consensus. It becomes much more technocratic. These are This is functionally a transactional country that um, you know, is is governed by uh, market incentives and will abide by international rules and could really be incorporated into the existing uh, liberal order. Um, but I think under under Xi Jinping, you've certainly seen tremendous backsliding that I think it's pretty clear that China has become effectively a, a brutal dictatorship at this point. And we, you can see it reflected in everything from uh, zero COVID to China's new economic policy to its efforts to spread uh, authoritarian surveillance technologies around the world. I mean, this is an area where now if the dictator says, I don't want there to be COVID deaths or I want to dominate this particular industry, this, the, the machinery of the state then gets mobilized to do that. And that, you know, from an economic perspective, that means you have a tremendous state player manipulating markets in ways that benefit that country and that are at odds with the rules that all these other countries have signed on to. Um, so there's just many areas where you could be right in, in in theory that you can have an autocracy that can be fully functional in this kind of environment, but the kind of autocracy that China has evolved into, especially over the last decade, I think is clearly not is not willing um, or or really able to abide by these rules. Yeah, the, there's um, also an argument to be to be made here that uh, behavior is is not simply a function of intentions; it's also a function of capabilities. And so you can make the argument that the Chinese Communist Party was always distinctly illiberal in how it viewed not just domestic society, but the world. But at a time when China was much weaker, it wasn't advantageous for the CCP to advertise its dissatisfaction with the existing order. The CCP didn't have the capabilities to challenge that order in the way that it's challenging them now. It's undeniable that Chinese power has grown markedly over the past 30 years. Or 40 years. And so we shouldn't be surprising that a regime that may not have liked how the world worked in 1995 is now challenging it far more assertively than before. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this, uh, the, the authoritarianism thing a little bit. And, what, and the extent to which China's aspiration is or isn't to, to spread authoritarianism per se. Um, I guess I'd say a couple of things. It it um, I mean, it certainly isn't isn't kind of uh, its policies aren't completely governed by an attempt to build a coalition of of, uh, you know, authoritarian autocrats. Um, you know, if you look at it seems to me that if you look at the regional tensions, it's about as likely to antagonize Vietnam, uh, you know, an, uh, an autocracy as it is Japan. And, and in fact, uh, Vietnam is one of its fiercest foes. Um, there's also the question of to what extent um, the the seeming 
uh, building of a coalition among authoritarians is a reaction to things that the West does. I'll give you uh, what I think is a good example. Um, you know, as you know, not long before the Ukraine invasion, Xi Jinping appeared with, with uh, Putin at the Olympics and they issued a joint declaration saying that their friendship had, quote, no limits. And the Wall Street Journal did kind of a deep dive into this that they said was based on discussions with unnamed Chinese officials and other Chinese elites. And they said that in the run up to that, uh, a couple of things happened. First of all, there was uh, a, a boycott, a, a quote, diplomatic boycott of China's Olympics uh, because of human rights issues. And then there was Biden's uh, the, the, geno the genocide issue, just to, to put a the, the, the Uyghur issue in particular in that case. But we do have a, a broader policy around the world of, of sanctioning. And, that, and that's relevant. I mean, you know, Venezuela, Cuba. We, we do a, we do a lot of this. But, and, I, and I emphasize that because my argument is that that kind of thing can drive these nations together in a way in a way that winds up looking as if it's the intentional construction of an authoritarian coalition. Anyway, let me finish with the Wall Street Journal thing. The um, so the journal said that uh, both that the human rights sanctioning and the uh, the the Biden's. Uh, Summit of Democracies, which, of course, obviously excluded uh, you know, China and Russia and was our way of saying we're better than you, uh, you know, that those things really antagonized him and led in a in a direct way to the formulation of that statement. That's the reporting from The Wall Street Journal. In any event, uh, you know, and, and I, I don't know, I don't know, who, you know, uh, the reporter's track record or anything, anonymous officials, who knows. But certainly you can imagine this kind of thing tends to happen for a couple of reasons. I mean, one is just that if you do make a big show of holding your summit of democracies and saying authoritarians are a threat to everything we hold dear, that is naturally going to, you know, draw them together if human psychology works the way I think it does. It, it, in a more practical uh, kind of material way, sanctions has the same effect because uh, you, you basically create a bunch of countries who are having trouble buying and selling what they want unless they deal with each other because the West has sanctioned them. So uh, it seems to me that this is this, is, you know, the perception, you know, we talked about the security dilemma, which depends uh, in some manifestations on seeing things as more offensive than the and intentional and, and sometimes as in, intentional as they actually are. It seems to me that in this realm in particular, there is really, really fertile ground for a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, based on our projecting certain uh, motivations onto authoritarian and uh, autocratic countries. Well, I mean, I'll just make a couple of comments, I guess. So so one is that um, I, I do not find it the least bit surprising that, that countries with different political systems find it difficult to trust and work with each other in the international environment when they interact as great powers, because you're right that the United States has autocratic allies and China has autocratic enemies. That's that's to be clear. But that's not that shouldn't surprise us, right? Because foreign foreign policy is typically meant to create an external environment in which a country and its domestic institutions can thrive. That's been true of the United States. That's been true of autocratic great powers. It's been true of a whole run of great powers in the past. And so there is a degree to which all great power competitions are ideological competitions. And the US, China relationship isn't anything special in, in that regard. With respect to, you know, the, the specific points you're making, the Russia-China strategic partnership, I mean, it, it long predates the summit of democracies. It long predates this round of the Beijing Olympics. It goes back a long way. And, and it shouldn't, again, it shouldn't be surprising because autocratic great powers have an interest in creating or preserving a world in which autocracies can thrive just as democratic great powers have an interest in preserving or creating a world where democracies can, can thrive. The final point I'd make, though, is that it, it's not incumbent upon us as analysts, even if we take the security dilemma seriously, to treat the ambitions of a China and the ambitions of a United States as being 
morally equivalent, right? And so, you know, when we're talking about the United States provoking China by imposing sanctions or not sending diplomats to the Beijing Olympics, what we're talking about is the United States deciding that it's not particularly acceptable for China to have a policy that a number of uh, international observers have said amounts to the genocide of the Uyghur people. It's not acceptable to put millions of folks in concentration camps and to do forcible sterilizations and, and so on and so forth. And so there is a moral dimension to international relations. It's not the only dimension, but it's an important one. And so when we talk about these types of disagreements between Washington and Beijing, let's be frank about what we're actually talking about. Yeah, well, my view on on the moral, I mean, that's a whole long conversation that I'd be happy to have. It's an important one because, you know, a, a difference between you and the so-called realists uh, is the extent to which the realists, uh, you know, don't want to get into uh, kind of domestic, uh, you know, internal conditions of, of nations. And I think one argument they make is that, you know, the intentions of this kind of intervention are admirable, but it just seems to almost never work and usually makes things worse for the people you're trying to help. I, I, I would really be willing to make that case if we had a whole nother conversation. If you want to come back, I'm happy to spend an hour on that. I really think uh, sanctions not only almost never work, usually make things worse for the kind of people we're claiming we're helping. But but um, that aside, the, the first thing you said, uh, Hal, was um, it's natural that uh, authoritarian autocracies would want to, a world in which their mode of governance isn't threatened. I, 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 you're right. I'm just making the point that certain things we do uh, that uh, probably uh, have, uh, in, in my view, uh, not any actual positive practical effect, like holding summits of democracies and stuff, make them feel more like they are the like the like they have to bond together if the world is going to be safe for for authoritarian autocracy well i i think um you could be right at the margins but i think what's really motivating them to band together is is just that the fact that the number of democracies in the world has doubled since the end of the cold war and so you've had this democratic tsunami that has really put authoritarian regimes under tremendous pressure and that pressure was bearable when china's economy was growing three times faster than the democratic average in the 90s and 2000s because they could sell that system. But now, you know, as we argue in the book with the slowing economy, autocracy isn't as easy of a sell. And because, you know, will how long will the Chinese people accept a lack of political rights if their their bank accounts aren't growing? And it just seems like China's leaders don't want to find out. And so they've gotten ahead of this by, first of all, building the most sophisticated domestic surveillance and repression system we've ever seen, but also to start exporting that system and to be operating it now in more than 80 countries around the world. I mean, partially to make money, but also because they know that autocracies tend to fall in waves. The democratic domino effect uh, brought down the communist regimes around Mike, Eastern Michael, Europe. Michael, I'm going to interrupt you. I'm going to interrupt you only because Hal had told us he needs to go at this very moment. If you want to stick around and talk a little more, that's fine with me. If you're uh, less constrained, uh, Hal apparently would actually have to pay some kind of penalty for checking out of his hotel room late. <laughs> we don't want that to happen. Um, uh, is that, you do have to leave, leave now, right, Hal? I, I, got, I got a couple more minutes. So I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy to engage. Okay. You know, engage another question. I mean, I mean, you, you know, I could go on forever about this stuff, but, but maybe we'll just, uh, we'll, we'll just have to have you both back or something. But, but anyway, so, so go ahead and finish, uh, Michael. Okay. Uh, so, you know, just this fear that uh, there's a contagion effect that if you have, the spread of democracies, especially in countries around your border where you may have ethnic kin, dictators tend to worry that their own people will start getting ideas or that that instability mm -hmm. can spread to them. I mean, this is why Xi Jinping, just like Putin, regularly frets about what they call color revolutions spreading. And so they just believe that their rule will be safer if authoritarianism is more prevalent because fellow despots won't punish them for their human rights abuses. Get... And, and they also... I'll, I'll just finish in like 10 seconds and then we can yeah. go on. And they, they also want democracies to look dysfunctional because that way, you know, the Chinese people won't want to emulate those systems. And so this is why, you know, we show in the book that she has been moving to secure his regime by actively trying to roll back democracy overseas. They, they are spending billions and billions of dollars on an anti-democratic toolkit of these NGOs and media outlets and hackers and bribes. And they're also pioneering this digital authoritarian system that basically takes the surveillance and messaging power of Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, and Twitter and concentrates its 
in the hands of uh, autocratic governments and allows them to uh, watch what their people are saying and viewing and what they like and dislike and to penalize people immediately by cutting off their access to right. uh, employment and medical care and credit and, and travel. And so it's just, th this, is, this is a serious threat. And even if you see this as a defensive motivation on behalf of these dictators, I don't think that necessarily makes it a moral a right. moral obligation to stand aside and allow them to uh, to pursue right. this. But let me just quickly say, I think they would say that's in part because we're doing the same thing, you know, through the National Endowment of Democracy and so on, and trying assertively to inject, uh, you know, to change their the, the form of government of all these countries. I'm not saying that's doing that is good or bad right now, but I'm saying I do think that's a perception. And so I want to emphasize what we do to make them uh, react, I think, sometimes uh, goes beyond just hosting summits of democracy. We have our own active operations to try to to uh, steer forms of government in the in the direction we want them. Uh, I'm not. I'm certainly not saying that there is no kind of natural, kind of beyond our control tendency of them to want to link up with authoritarians. I'm just saying it may be that there are some things we're doing that are making the problem worse than it need be. And, and I'll just close uh, and then let both of you say whatever you want. Um, by saying there was, it seemed to me there is an irony in your book that is related, that, that this is an instance of, but but is in a way more general. You say that the reason uh, we, we should worry about China lashing out now in various ways is that, including things we didn't uh, get to talk about, uh, like, you know, software and stuff, uh, is because they feel threatened. They feel strategically encir encircled regionally. They feel threatened by democracies and, and, and so on. It's the sense of threat that is a big part of the danger they pose. And yet it seems to me a lot of your prescriptions amount to heightening, their, have the effect of heightening their sense of threat and encirclement. So that seems to me at least an irony that you've probably thought about, right? Some people say, well, wait a second. If, if the problem is they feel threatened, Maybe we should ease up instead of clamp down, right? If the more threatened they feel, the more dangerous the world is. Why do you want to make them feel more threatened, you know, militarily, ideologically, and so on? If you think that Chinese behavior threatens important American interests, we, we do. Not everybody does, right? But right. we do, and that's what the analysis in the book indicates. Then you have a choice. You can either take measures that allow you to defend those interests or you can say anything that we do to protect those interests will antagonize China, thus we cannot do anything, right? We think the latter course would be more dangerous, even though we recognize that steps that we do to strengthen Taiwan or push back against Chinese technological influence will annoy the CCP. Other point I'd make here is you mentioned realism. One of the reasons that realism is having a hard time being taken seriously these days is that the, the hardcore realists make the argument that regime type has nothing to do with international behavior unless you're looking at the United States, right? Then it's America's liberal delusions, it's America's domestic politics that are doing the work. Uh, there's less attention to the fact that that may also be the case. There may also be domestic factors that influence the calculations of Xi and Putin. I, I agree that's a shortcoming of hardcore realism. Uh, yeah, Michael, did you want to say something in closing? No, uh, no. Nope, nope. Just thank okay. you for having us on. Okay. Hal, I think you, you isolated something that we probably we disagree is the extent to which China does inherently threaten uh, American interests and, and really the, the interests even more broadly of things uh, America champions like like uh, global democracy and so on. But um, uh, but thank you so much uh, for coming on. The, the book is Danger Zone, The Coming Conflict with China. Authors are Hal Brands, Michael Beckley. Where else can they uh, find you guys? Like, uh, do you have Twitter handles or anything? Uh, I, I tweet ineffectually. Uh, I think it's at Hal Brands, uh, and you can find me uh, weekly at uh, Bloomberg Opinion. All right. I, I don't do any social media, but um, I try to put as many of my uh, articles and stuff up online. Um, it's MichaelBeckley.org. If you just Google my name, it'll be okay. should be the first thing that comes up.